Our theme tonight is standing together for our common future. We all share the responsibility for our common future. The challenge is to stand together to assure the best possible future for our children and grandchildren. This is a global challenge and it should be a universal desire. The nuclear age is just 67 years old. During this short time, we humans have created, by our technological prowess, some serious obstacles to assuring our common future. Climate change, pollution of the oceans and atmosphere, modern warfare and its preparations, and nuclear dangers are at the top of any list of critical global problems. None of these dangers can be solved by any one country alone. It, it no longer takes only a village. It actually takes a world. And within that world, it takes, if not each of us, certainly far more of us. Let me share with you how Archbishop Tutu, a foundation advisor and one of the great moral leaders of our time, describes nuclear weapons. He says, nuclear weapons are an obscenity. They are the very antithesis of humanity, of goodness in this world. What security do they help establish? What kind of world community are we actually seeking to build when nations possess and threaten to use arms that can wipe all of humankind off the globe in an instant? At the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, we work to abolish nuclear weapons, insanely destructive weapons that cannot be used or even possessed without violating the most basic legal and moral precepts. Nuclear weapons threaten civilization and our very survival as a species. And yet, 50 years after the Cuban Missile Crisis and 20 years after the end of the Cold War, the United States and Russia still keep some 2,000 of these weapons on high alert ready to be fired within moments of an order to do so. So it's good to take note that these weapons have not gone away, nor have the dangers that they pose to humanity. There are still some 19,000 of them in the world. 95% of these are in the arsenals of the United States and Russia, and the remaining 5% are held by seven other countries. Nuclear weapons do not protect us. They are not, wep the, nuclear weapons are not a defense. They are good only for threatening retaliation or committing senseless acts of vengeance. The use of nuclear weapons is beyond the control of any country. Let me illustrate this by talking for a moment about nuclear famine. If uh, India and Pakistan had a sm relatively small nuclear war, using 50 nuclear weapons each on the other side's cities, that would put enough soot into the upper stratosphere to block and reduce warming sunlight for up to 10 years. That in turn would shorten growing seasons. Lower That, that in turn would lower temperatures on Earth to the lowest levels that they've been in a thousand years, shorten growing seasons, uh, cause crop failures, and lead to a famine in which several hundred million people would die of starvation. Um, I think it's important for me to emphasize that this would be the result of a small nuclear war using only half a percent of the explosive power in today's nuclear arsenals. All of this is serious and sobering, but you may ask, what can I do? 
At the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, we are working on collective action and collective impact in which the whole, meaning each of us standing together, is much greater than the sum of its parts. We are also pursuing legal action related to breaches of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty by the United States and other nuclear weapon states parties to this treaty. This treaty calls for a cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date. It calls for nuclear disarmament, and it calls for a treaty on general and complete disarmament, and the parties to the treaty are asked to negotiate those ends in good faith. Since the treaty entered into force, however, in 1970, it would be very hard to argue, 42 years later, that there has been a secession of the nuclear arms race at an early date. In other words, it's too late for an early date, but of course it's not too late to pursue nuclear disarmament and a treaty on general and complete disarmament as called for by the treaty. Our current education and advocacy work reaches and mobilizes some 57,000 members of the foundation who join in taking action for our common future. We hope in the relatively new fu near future to expand the number of people that we're engaged with around the world exponentially. We hope that all of you will join us in this mission to assure that there is a human future. Now, another part of our mission at the foundation is the empowerment of peace leaders. We're very fortunate here to have an extremely talented, intelligent, and enthusiastic leader for this program. His name is Paul Chappell. He is a West Point graduate who has published three books on ending war and building peace and is currently working on a fourth book. He travels the country and the world, but very much in this country, giving lectures and workshops on peace leadership. He is a purveyor of hope and reason. He'll tell you now about the Foundation's peace leadership program. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for being here, and I'd like to talk to you this evening about why peace leadership is so vital in the 21st century and why I have so much hope for the future. And to explain that, I must first tell you a part of my own story about how I arrived here, how I grew up in Alabama, I graduated from West Point, I served in the Army for seven years, I was deployed to Baghdad, and now I'm working here for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation in Santa Barbara. So one aspect of my life's journey that led me here were the effects of racism. My father was born in 1925, and he was half white and half black, and he grew up in Virginia under segregation in the South. And ever since I was a small child, my father always told me, the only place in America where a black man has a fair chance is in the Army. And I remember in the late 1980s, early 1990s, my father would point to the television, and he'd say, look at Colin Powell. He'd say, look at Colin Powell. Colin Powell is the highest ranking person in the military, and he's black. And then my father would say, have you ever seen a black president before? And my father died in 2004 before President Obama became the first black president. And my father wasn't telling me untruth. He was telling me his truth. He was telling me about life as he had experienced it in the South under segregation. And because my father had me when he was 54 years old, there was a generation skip between us. And so he raised me to think like somebody who lived before civil rights. And this continued after my father died. When I told my mother I was getting out of the army three years ago, my mother's Korean, my father's half white and half black. When I told my mother I was getting out of the army three years ago, she said, are you crazy? She said, are you out of your mind? She goes, no one's going to give you a job. No one's going to hire you. She said, it's bad enough you look Asian, but you're also part black. She said, she said who's going to give a job to a black man who looks Asian? When I was growing up, I looked at segregation, I looked at slavery, and I thought, how did those things happen? 
Did the slave owners wake up every morning and think they're bad people? No. What kept those systems of injustice going? And all these systems of injustice are built upon a very simple myth or a very simple series of myths. So what myth kept slavery and segregation going? There were three primary myths that kept se segregation and slavery going. Can anybody guess what those myths were? What myth was segregation and slavery built upon? The first myth is that African Americans are subhuman. They are genetically inferior and they are subhuman. The second myth is that African Americans are born to be slaves and they're happy being slaves. Back then people thought, my dog's happy being a dog, my cat's happy being a cat, my sheep are happy being sheep, and my slaves are happy being slaves. And I can't let my slaves go. That'd be like me letting my sheep and my cattle go. They wouldn't know how to survive without me protecting them. And the third myth was that society will collapse if you abolish slavery. Who's going to pick all the crops if slavery is gone? But all those things turned out to be untrue. So every system of injustice or oppression is built upon a myth and once you unravel the myth, the whole system becomes, begins to come apart. But to do that, you have to have a very strategic, disciplined, well-trained movement. You have to have a very strategic, disciplined, well-trained movement. So the Peace Leadership Program focuses on three aspects of training. The first aspect of training is the broader perspective, the strategic perspective. How do you persuade how people think who have an opposing point of view? How do you transform how people think about a controversial issue? How do you do more than preach to the choir? If any American politician today were to say that we should bring back slavery, bring back segregation, women shouldn't be able to own, vote or own property, people would look at him like he's insane. But 200 years ago, that's how most Americans thought, and that's how virtually every politician spoke. So if attitudes could change so dramatically about the oppression of women, about slavery, about segregation, why can't we change attitudes toward war, environmental destruction, and nuclear weapons? The second aspect of the training is the interpersonal level. How do you connect with people's humanity? All those people skills, how do you calm people down? How do you motivate people, inspire people, empower people? And those are not just, pe those are not just peace leadership skills. Those are also very important life skills. Even how do you listen is an important life skill that is vital for peace leadership. The third aspect is the inner struggle, the struggle for inner peace. My father fought in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. He fought in those two wars, and he had a lot of trauma from the wars. And I grew up in a very violent household, and I was bullied a lot growing up because I'm not white. And I had to overcome my own rage and develop that sense of inner peace and expand my empathy and my love for humanity in order to be effective at this kind of work. Otherwise, you'll get burned out. You'll get bitter, and you'll just get burned out. The oppression of women. 200 years ago, women couldn't vote, women couldn't own property, women couldn't go to college. What very simple myth kept that going? Three very simple myths. What kept the oppression of women going? Anybody want to guess? Pardon? Good, exactly. The first myth is that women are intellectually inferior to men. Women are intellectually inferior to men. You can read that in Aristotle, you can read that in Darwin. In Darwin's Descent of Man, he talks about how women are genetically inferior to men. So the first myth is that women are intellectually inferior to men. The second myth is that women are morally inferior to men. And the third myth is that society will collapse if we give women their rights. So the Founding Fathers talked about no taxation without representation. The Founding Fathers talked about no taxation without representation. Does anybody remember what that means from elementary school history? What it means is that you, can no long, you cannot tax me unless you give me participation in the political process. You cannot tell me what to do unless you give me a vote. If you were going to govern me, you needed my consent to govern me. But prior to the 1820s and 1830s, 50 years later, less than 10% of the American population could vote. Women couldn't vote. African Americans couldn't vote. Native Americans couldn't vote. Most white people couldn't vote unless they owned land. So how did women get the right to vote and own property? How did they get that right? Did they fight a war? They used nonviolent struggle. How did the non how did the non landowners get the right to vote? They used nonviolent struggle. And even though the Civil War kept the Union together, it took a peaceful movement before African Americans truly got their human rights. And how many European countries had a war to free the slaves? Zero. 
So why aren't we taught that in school? Why are we taught that we got all of our freedoms through war when 40 years after the Revolutionary War, most of the American people were not free people? And they got the majority of their rights nonviolently. If you look at non-landowners, women, African Americans, getting their civil rights, their human rights, transforming that myth, refuting that myth through that nonviolent movement. So one last injustice I want to talk about is the injustice of nuclear weapons. What myth keeps that going? Three, again. The first myth, they make us safe, they make us secure. Deterrence theory, mutually assured destruction, they work as a deterrent. But that, if that were true, why wouldn't we want every country to have nuclear weapons? If deterrence theory really worked and every country had nuclear weapons, wouldn't we have world peace according to the, the logic of deterrence theory? If deterrence theory worked, why would we care if Iran had one nuclear weapon? And if you want to know more about that, I recommend our video, which is in the back, about deterrence theory. The second myth is that nuclear weapons are weapons of peace. They're weapons of peace. They protect peace. We had a nuclear weapon called the Peacekeeper, and the motto of Strategic Air Command, which, which was in charge of much of the nuclear weapons arsenal, their motto was, peace is our profession. And the third myth is that the world will end, society will collapse, because if we don't have them, we'll be invaded. And none of, none of this is true, and I, again, I recommend our video, which is in the back. You can get it afterward. So I have a lot of hope for the future because all these systems of injustice, they're built upon deception, myth, lies, illusions. But every lie has a fatal flaw. The fatal flaw of every lie is it's not true. And the truth always prevails, right? People used to not be able to say the earth goes around the sun, but that myth was refuted as well. But the problem we're dealing with now threatens human survival. So the problem we're dealing with now is a question of will the truth prevail in time? Because if we don't act quickly enough, the human race won't survive because this problem threatens human survival. And what percent of the American population made those things happen? What percent of the American population actively participated in the women's rights movement? Less than 1% actively participated. What percent of the American population actively participated in the civil rights movement? Less than 1% actively participated. So a very small percent of committed, dedicated people can make a huge difference. And the reason we have a better world today than we had 100 or 200 years ago is because people did something. But that 1% has to be very disciplined, very strategic, very well trained, and that is what the Peace Leadership Program will accomplish. And if you have any questions, I'll be in the back afterward. And again, I want to thank you for being here and enjoy your dinner. So tonight we stand together with the people of the Marshall Islands, a country that was part of the trust territory of the United States after World War II. The Marshall Islanders are easygoing and friendly people. They put their trust in the United States, but we abuse that trust by, by testing nuclear weapons on their territory. We began uh, atmospheric nuclear testing in 1946 when we were the only country in the world that possessed nuclear weapons. And we continued testing in the Marshall Islands until 1958, a period of 12 years. During that period, we tested 67 nuclear and thermonuclear weapons. Um, and those weapons that we tested, those 67 weapons, had the equivalent power of 1.7 Hiroshima bombs each day for the 12 year period that we tested there. So just to be clear, we tested 67 times, but it was the power of those weapons that was equal to 1.7 Hiroshima bombs each day for a period of 12 years. On March 1st, 1954, we tested our, our largest nuclear bomb ever, codenamed Bravo. It had the power of 15 million tons of TNT. In the testing, 
we irradiated many of the people of the Marshall Islands, causing them death, injury, and untold sorrow. Many had to leave their home islands and live elsewhere. Many have suffered cancers and leukemia, and the illnesses and death have carried over into the children of new generations of Marshall Islanders. These are the tragic effects of a world that maintains, tests, and relies upon nuclear weapons. In this world, our human rights are threatened and abused by nuclear weapons, as the Marshall Islanders have experienced firsthand. As a traditional nation, the Marshallese enjoyed a self-sufficient, sustainable way of life before nuclear weapons testing. Now, they struggle to uphold basic human rights, the right to adequate health and life, the right to adequate food and nutrition, the right to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation, the right to enjoyment of a safe, clean, and healthy, sustainable environment. In September of this year, the Foundation's representative in Geneva spoke to the United Nations Human Rights Council on behalf of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, but speaking for the Marshall Islanders. He stated, quote, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation aligns itself with the United Nations Special Rapporteur's suggestion that the international community, the United States, and the government of the Marshall Islands must develop long-term strategic measures to address the effects of the nuclear testing program and specific challenges in each atoll. As such, it is imperative that the United States government and the international community implement human rights measures to provide adequate redress to the citizens of the Marshall Islands. In other words, it is part of the responsibility of the United States and other nuclear weapon states to clean up the radioactive trail of dangerous debris and of suffering and human rights abuses that they have left behind in their pursuit of ever more powerful and efficient nuclear arms. The man we honor tonight, Senator Tony DeBroom, was a child when the United States nuclear testing was taken, taking place in his islands. Born in 1945, he personally witnessed most of the detonations that took place and was nine years old when the most powerful of those explosions, the Bravo test, took place. He went on to become one of the first Marshall Islanders to graduate from college from the University of Hawaii in Manoa. And he focused on helping his people to extricate themselves from the legacy of US nuclear testing in his island country. He has dedicated his life to helping his people and to working to assure that they are fairly compensated for the wrongs done to them by nuclear testing. He has served his people in many ways, as a parliamentarian, former minister of foreign affairs, and foreign, former minister of health and the environment. He currently represents Kwajalein in the parliament of the Marshall Islands and is the minister in assistance to the president of the Marshall Islands. Like others who have suffered and witnessed the suffering caused by nuclear weapons, he has a larger vision that what happened to his people should not happen again to any other people or country. I've known Senator Tony DeBroom for many years. He is an untiring leader of his people, 
deeply engaged in seeking justice. He is a man with a vision of creating a more decent and peaceful future for all humanity. Senator Tony DeBroom is a dedicated peace leader. And tonight, we're very pleased to stand with Senator DeBroom and the people of the Marshall Islands, all the people of the Marshall Islands, as we honor him with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation's 2012 Distinguished Peace Leadership Award. Join me in welcoming him to the stage. I think David does not want to let on that we are very old, old friends, because we might betray our age. But David was my sensei in college. He was my karate instructor, and he made a man out of me. That's what he said many, many, many years ago. I'm delighted to be here. I'm honored. It is with profound gratitude and humility that I received this Distinguished Peace Leadership Award of 2012. I wish to thank the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation for the great honor. I am aware that in receiving this award, I am following in the footsteps of some of the most gallant and respected notables of our century. Among them, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the late King Hussein, Jacques Cousteau, Walter Cronkite, and many other distinguished champions of peace. I am truly humbled to be following the lead of such exceptional human beings. With their contributions to world peace and harmony, they have touched and influenced many of us gathered this evening and impacted the lives of many more around the world. My life was deeply traumatized by the nuclear legacy of the United States in the Marshall Islands. My public career has been shaped by the nuclear insult to my country and the Marshallese people. I have endeavored to make my modest contributions to peace by bringing their story to the world through all opportunities available to me. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have been a student of this horrific impact of nuclear weapons testing program for most of my life. I served as an interpreter for the American officials who proclaimed the bikini safe for resettlement and commenced the program to repatriate the bikini people who for decades barely survived on a secluded island called Kili. I also accompanied the American High Commissioner just two years later to once again remove the repatriated residents of bikini because concentrations of strontium and cesium had exceeded safe limits and their exposure had become too high for established U.S. government health standards. I was personally involved in the Anahuatoc Environmental Impact Statement that declared Anahuatoc Atoll in the Western Marshall Islands safe for resettlement. In a television interview on CBS 60 Minutes that year, 1973, I expressed my concern to Morley Safer that the military public relations program associated with this cleanup project was more a dog and pony show than anything else. Today, as we speak, most of Anueta is still unsuitable for human habitation. There is a grave, a former crater from one of the tests in Anahuatak that has been filled with radioactive material that renders most of the atoll unsafe for human habitation for 12,000 years. 
Later, during the, ter during the ne negotiations to terminate the trust territory, we discovered that certain scientific information regarding Anahuaytoc was being withheld from us because, as the U.S. official government memo said, quote, the Marshallese negotiators might make overreaching demands on the United States if these facts about the extent of damage in the islands were known to them. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Marshall Islands' close encounter with the bomb did not just end after the 12 years that David described earlier. In recent years, documents released by the United States government have uncovered even more horrific aspects of this burden borne by the Marshallese people in the name of international peace and security, or as they were told by the commander who removed the Bikini people from their atoll, it is in the hands of God and is for the good of mankind. U.S. government documents proved in no uncertain terms that its scientists conducted human radiation experiments on Marshallese citizens and American servicemen assigned to our part of the world. Some of our people were injected or coerced to imbibe fluids laced with radioactive substances. Other experimentation involved the purposeful and premature resettlement of people on islands highly contaminated by the weapons test to study how human beings absorb radionuclides either from their foods or from their poisonous environment. Much of this exp experimentation occurred in populations either exposed to already near lethal amounts of radiation or to control populations who were told they would receive medical care for participating in these studies to help their fellow citizens. At the conclusion of all these studies, <clears throat> the United States still maintained that no positive linkage could be established between the tests and the health status of the Marshallese people. The word they used was, you are too few, and therefore statistically insignificant. Just in the past, past few years, a National Cancer Institute study has predicted a substantively higher than expected incidence of cancer soon to be experienced in the Marshall Islands resulting from the 50s atomic test. <clears throat> Throughout the years, American nuclear history in the Marshall Islands has been colored with official denial, self-serving control of information, abrogation of commitment to redress the shameful wrongs done to the people. The scientists and the military officials in, involved in the testing program picked and chose their study subjects, recognized certain communities as exposed when it served their interests, and denied monitoring and medicinal attention to subgroups within the islands, even though they had been substantially exposed. I remember well their visits to my village in Lique, where they subjected every one of us to tests and other invasive physical examinations. In 1978, as a representative of the Marshall Islands, we raised the issue requesting that the data collected from these, from these examinations be provided to us so that we could make intelligence intelligent decisions as to how to move forward. The United States representatives responded by saying that our recollections were juvenile and could not possibly reflect the realities of the time. <clears throat> While a resolution to the status question was eventually reached, the issue of damages and personal injury from the testing remains a matter of contention between our two countries to this day. The unresolved 
aspect of the agreement remains the question of damages and personal injury claims yet to be addressed. Attempts to resolve these outstanding issues through the current treaty between our countries, the Compact of Free Association, have not been successful. The courts have invoked the state statutes of limitations, while the administration contends that the circumstances of the claims do not constitute provable differences, change circumstances, they say, from knowledge based on which the agreements in 1986 were entered into. We do not deny signing an agreement. We do admit, though, that this was based on information tailored and provided to us to minimize the extent of the damage. And it is only now that we're finding out that it was much worse than had been presented to us. In order to break this impasse, we would require evidence which has been declared top secret by the United States government to which the public has no access. It is interesting to note that the United States has expressed strong interest to bring the nuclear issues in the Marshall Islands to closure. As recently as three months ago, Assistant Secretary Kurt Campbell visited us and told us that this was the policy of the Obama administration. But we have responded that there can be no closure without full disclosure. Further, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the United States government tells us our government, our Marshallese government, is now responsible for nuclear claims, stemming from what is called the espousal provision of the Compact of Free Association. That basically says that any claims that may arise against the United States stemming from the testing program will now be the responsibility, and the Marshallese government will be reliable for those damages. Ironically, the only other time in history of the United States where espousal was used to squelch claims was in the settlement to release the hostages from Iran. <clears throat> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Last month in Geneva, and David also referred to this, the session of the United Nations Human Rights Council adopted the Independent Special Rapporteur's report, which in short found that the U.S. nuclear testing program in the Marshall Islands resulted in both immediate and continuing effects on the human rights of the Marshallese people. The adopted report also sets forth a set of far-reaching recommendations. Among them, guarantee the right to effective remedy for the Marshallese people, including providing full funding for the Nuclear Claims Tribunal to award adequate compensation for past and future claims, and exploring other forms of reparation where appropriate, such as restitution, rehabilitation, measures of satisfaction, including public apologies, public memorials, and guarantees of non-repetition. Guarantees of non-repetition. The establishment of a truth and reconciliation mechanism may also be justified. How far the United States government will act on these recommendations remain uncertain. However, I must say with full emphasis here that in spite of all that has occurred in this relationship, the American people will not find better friends in the Pacific than the people of the Marshall Islands. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I accept this high honor you bestow upon me this evening in the name of my country my fellow citizens, and all who have in one way or another
contributed to the understanding of the Marshallese nuclear play. I accepted on behalf of Lijan Eganilang and Almira Mariusi of Rongala Atoll, who passed away recently but were never discouraged in their fight to find peace and justice. I dedicated to the mothers of Rongolat, whose shameful treatment by American scientists violated all acceptable norms of human decency and respect. I accepted on behalf of Senator Jideng Anjain, who exposed the dark secrets of the experimentation on the Rongolat people. This honor I also share with Mayor Anjain's son, Luggage Anjain, who became the first recognized leukemia victim of the nuclear test. I accept this honor on behalf of the Marshallese traditional leaders, especially Hiroyalabala Chaburo Kabua and Anjua Loya, who made lands under their stewardship available for the humane settlement of displaced nuclear nomads. I accepted on behalf of the Marshallese community leaders who petitioned in vain to stop the tests in 1952 and 1954 and again in 1956. Through the avenues known to them, both directly to the United States and to the United Nations, all without success. I accept on behalf of Senator Ismail John of Anuetak Atoll, who fought to his death to bring justice to the people of his home, who to this day remain unable to settle their ancestral land, and whose atoll continues to store nuclear waste such as plutonium. I would be remiss if I did not include the many friends throughout the world who have contributed to our knowledge of the dangers of nuclear weapons and the clear and present danger they are to the universe as we know it. I accept it on behalf of all Marshallese whose lives have been directly or indirectly affected by the horrific effects of nuclear tests. <clears throat> but most of all, and my good friend David knows this, I accept on behalf of my granddaughter Zoe, <clears throat> who as a brave young four-year-old battled with leukemia for two years very difficult years, and is now <clears throat> declared healthy enough to resume school. She's happy back in the islands, and I thank God for this wonderful blessing. <clears throat> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> for the use of our country in the maintenance of what is called an unquestionable military supremacy over the world. Kwajalein Atoll, which is my parliamentary constituency and which is the target of the shots that you hear shooting from Vandenberg, has been tasked to bear the burden of the current missile testing under the Ballistic Systems Missile Defense Command. I therefore dedicate this honor also to the people of Kwajalein whose continued sacrifice of providing the home of their forefathers for the, quote, preservation of international peace and security, end quote, continues to this day and for the next 74 years. The Marshall Islands are, no, are by no means the only ones who have experienced a taste of nuclear horror. We associate ourselves with the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Kazakhstan, Chernobyl, Fukushima, the French Polynesians who have had firsthand experience. As David stated to you earlier, the 67 nuclear events in the Marshalls had an equivalent yield of 1.7 Hiroshima shots every day, 365 days a year, for 12 years, every day, 365 days a year, for 
for 12 years. This came complete with physical displacement, nuclear illness, birth anomalies, alienation of land, massive destruction of property, injury and death, and the permanent displacement of society. But perhaps the most hurtful of all within that umbrella of destruction is the fact that official denial and secretive cover-up and refusal to accept responsibility was the rule rather than the exception. The Marshall Islands were also subject to years of expensive cleanup and rehabilitation of land and, and of habitat. Millions were spent by the U.S. military to demonstrate that contamination from nuclear bombs could, in fact, be cleaned up. That has not succeeded. Hundreds of millions of dollars and many years of military man hours spent in the marshals have failed to clean up what is left, not from a war, but from testing the weapons of war. Most of these islands, as I've stated before, that are declared unfit for human habitation will be so declared for at least 12,000 years. Perhaps the most important lesson to be learned is that any way you look at it, nuclear weapons and the horrific destruction that they bring, whether in war or in experimentation, leave permanent and irreversible damage to man and nature. All things surrounding nuclear weaponry threaten life on our planet and perhaps even in our universe. It is not good for men and women. It's not good for boys and girls. It is not good for dogs and cats. It's harmful to trees, to the plants we eat. It poisons fish and wildlife. It makes our world less, not more, secure. If the lessons of the end of World War II and the lessons of all the tests conducted since then have not been learned, then we must learn them. If the experiences of laboratory exposure also denied are not part of our learning pathway, then they must be added. If we do not take the message of nuclear survivors to heart, then we will have to soften our hearts. Nuclear weapons threaten us. They do not protect us. No matter where they are located or deployed, one push of a red button could be the end of life as we know it. This is not a chance worth taking. If we continue to imagine any kind of a benefit being derived from the fact that the atomic powers are now armed to the teeth, then the sacrifice of all that we have cited in my brief message tonight would have been in vain. Enlightened modern thinkers of the world have not been blind to this fact. It is just that they have yet to put the matter of the nuclear race to rest. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Barely 48 hours ago, my colleague Bruce Kitchener, who has been very kind to assist me on this trip, was in India at the 11th Conference of the Parties on the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, where 193 countries, both governments and non-government entities, met to discuss the accelerated decline in the integrity of the environment and its genetic resources. Also debated were programs and efforts to address the unsustainable global development direction and the dangers that it poses to the world. As in nuclear disarmament efforts, we have a situation where world leaders fully understand the problem, are aware of the solutions, but cannot decide who should go first. There is no question that if civilization does not keep global warming under two degrees centigrade by 2050, this effort to protect Mother Earth, either through nuclear peace 
or through environmental sanity will be in vain. I am confident that the entire membership of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, which I am honored to be part of today, is familiar with the issue and knows what must be done to avoid climate chaos. But like nuclear disarmament, the world knows the problem, it knows the solution, but lacks the political will to execute. As a small island developing state, the Marshall Islands and its neighbors are among the most ecologically vulnerable areas on the planet. We are the victims, again, of world action, but in a different arena. Nevertheless, we are actively working with other Pacific Islands to ensure that ocean resources in the region are governed and protected from exploitation. As a nation whose single most important productive sector and key export is in fisheries, the state of the world's oceans and fish stocks, and how these vital resources are being exploited remain on the list of our immediate priorities. Recently, the Marshall Islands, in partnership with Palau and Micronesia, and with some very, very good advice from our friends in Hawaii and Japan, have undertaken a feasibility study for the introduction of ocean thermal energy into our islands. This technology which, which uses the difference in deep ocean water temperatures to generate electricity, create water and other market, marketable byproducts is very exciting indeed. If successful, OTEC will turn the Marshall Islands and its neighbors from oil dependent basket cases to net exporters of renewable, sustainable clean energy. I should say that on this score, we salute our enlightened leaders and what we see as enlightened efforts on sustainable energy amongst our friends here in California. And we know that many of you have been in this area, very proactive. The Marshall Islands cannot afford to wait for global movement on climate change or on nuclear peace. We're barely two meters above the sea level, and <clears throat> if you're only six feet above sea level, the stakes are pretty high here. And having had our share of displaced populations from the nuclear testing program, we do not see moving our people elsewhere as a viable option. We are partnering with our neighbors in Micronesia in examining alternative financial mechanisms for economic security and have, had, have held a debt for adaptation swap uh, on climate change workshop in the Marshalls recently. These promises to promise to be innovative means of dealing with non-performing government development loans of the recent past which keep our islands from developing effectively. The Micronesia Challenge is a partnership of island states of the North Pacific to jointly set aside for protection and for conservation areas of their individual and co collective territories. In addition, Palau, the state of Korsai in Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands have declared a total ban on the harvesting and finning of sharks in their economic zone, effectively creating the world's largest shark sanctuary. We are taking these steps as proud stewards and protectors of some of the world's richest and most diverse ecosystems. We want to leave our planet intact for the benefit of our children and their children's children. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation has been stalwart in its mission of nuclear disarmament and the elimination of nuclear threat to man. For the nearly two decades I have been associated with its efforts, I can attest to its diligence and dedication to marshal its resources to the promotion of peace and harmony 
in a nuclear-free world. That goal is pure in its intent. It's necessary in pursuit and is the only option, the only option through which we can leave a world where healthy children and a healthy environment can live in harmony now and forever. For whatever is remaining of my life, I pledge to follow this dream that one day we can rid the world of the scourge of nuclear weapons. That peace can be achieved not by what harm we can do to each other, but by what good we can do together. I share in this award, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and recognize with gratitude those who have walked with me in this journey. I want to thank most especially my wife and my best friend, Rosalie, and our three daughters, Doreen, Dolores, and Sally Ann, for always standing by my side and supporting me, even when odds were overwhelming. My dad, my brothers, my sisters, and the numerous people in the islands who've made it possible for me to be recognized and honored, I wish to express to you my deepest gratitude and pamoro, and my hollows to my friends in Hawaii as well. For me, the work to address the plight of all affected people continues with renewed determination. We owe it to the nuclear victims and the nuclear survivors. But most importantly, we owe it to the future generations of this planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Broom, De Broom, both for the marvelous work that you've done that results in your award this evening and for the inspiring words that you presented to each of us. Thank you so much. For those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, uh, my name is Peter MacDougall, and I have the pleasure of serving on the Board of Directors for the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. As some of you may have noticed, we have with us tonight over 80 students, thanks to the generous support of many sponsors, among them the Santa Barbara Foundation and other individuals. One of the areas of focus of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is empowering the next generation to become leaders who think critically and take action for a peaceful, nuclear weapons-free world. Please join me in recognizing these aspiring leaders. You are the future, and we have a video just for you that shows one of the ways you can get involved. But if our student guests would stand this evening, we would like to recognize you. Thank you. I believe someone other than myself is going to be responsible for turning the video on. At least I hope that's the case. I study political science in Savannah, Georgia at the Armstrong Atlantic State University. I'm a political science major with an international relations emphasis and a minor in Global Peace and Security. I'm getting a master's at this school, um, the Patterson School of Diplomacy, and I'm studying diplomacy and international organizations. I'm a second year poli-sci major at the University of California, Santa Barbara. There's a lot to gain from being an intern at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Uh, you're constantly thrust into a frame of thinking that may be uncomfortable. It's a powerful exercise in thought. All of the interns at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation really have the opportunity to explore their skills and their talents. It's really great you get your foot in the door. 
Um, a lot of times to get into work in the Beltway, in the DC Beltway, involving nuclear advocacy, requires you having some level of experience or proven interest. You gain a much greater understanding of international relations and policy making. My ideas are actually listened to and acknowledged and considered deeply. They really want to teach the interns and have them learn like an on-the-job experience rather than just stick them in the back making copies and making the coffee. The organization has a lot of connections both in the United Nations and in DC. Getting across a viewpoint effectively is something that um, certainly gained more uh, by working at the Nuclear HP Foundation. A lot of really major um, names and minds have come through, have advocated for what's going on here, and have helped uh, Nuclear HP Foundation influence others. I get an assignment or a question from David or Rick that's not always, you know, cut and dry or laid out step by step. That's precisely the point. They wanted to delegate that duty to someone else. I've been able to work on the blog a lot and work on social media outlets like Facebook. I participated in the Nuclear Deterrence Conference that the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation hosted. It's a great opportunity um, to get familiar with any of the nuclear issues and learn about these issues and then do something tangible and find a solution to them. You're actually doing publishing, you're doing writing, um, on your own. So um, just like any other advocacy job, I mean, you'll be doing the work that the other people here are doing. I will be working for the national government. Um, at this time, I'm not really sure which organ it's going to be in, but hopefully the State Department. Initially working for a think tank um, or a nonprofit advocacy group in DC, eventually working with the government or even potentially eventually working for the United Nations. Go study in Chile for a while. I'm um, doing the Education Abroad program through UCSB. I started my Peace Corps application the other day. Next is grad school, and then I would love to come back and work in some way with this foundation or an affiliated foundation. The process of applying takes took me about a little less than a year, but I, I did my research. I would research it for a long time, and um, I, I entered everything very early. Make sure you know the issues involved in nuclear weapons really well. It has to be a passion. It has to be something you are passionate about because it, if you're not, your heart's not going to be in it. Make sure that you feel comfortable when you come here with working on your own, um, with being given a project and being expected to have results. It's very competitive, but Rick told me we're looking for people who believe in the cause. And what he also said was that he noticed that I opened every one of the Sunflower newsletters. This experience has, has given me the passion and the drive and the innovation to take what I do in school and apply it to the real life. I'd like to thank those who have served as interns in the past, those that may serve in the future, the wonderful staff of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation who worked so successfully with them, and the sponsors and donors that make these internships possible. It means so very much. Empowering the next generation to become leaders for peace is crucial to our common future as our strategic actions that we take to eliminate nuclear weapons. Senator DeBroom and the Marshallese show us how we as citizens of the world must take action to end the terrible nucle nuclear weapons threat to us all. Risk assessment work, including out of Stanford by Dr. Martin Hellman, concludes that a child born today has one in six chances of being killed by a nuclear weapon within his or her 80-year expected lifetime. This frightening statistic bears repeating. A child born today has a one in six chance of being killed by a nuclear weapon within his or her 80-year expected lifetime. And while this statistic is both obscene and unacceptable, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is working to change it. And here's the important part. We have a renewed 
plan, and that change will take place. So I'm pleased to share with you what the board and staff of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation have focused on for this past year in developing, in developing a targeted strategic plan that is action-oriented. A new direction seeks to convene a consortium of organizations that will act collectively to deliver a strong, unified message to the governments and public. We are working to bring together the various groups who align with our mission, including religious, environmental, health, and many other types, both national and international groups within and outside of the nuclear abolition field. We're bringing them together around the shared agenda to ch achieve a nuclear weapons convention and treaty by the year 2020 for the phased, verifiable, irreversible, and transparent elimination of nuclear weapons. <laughs> Any objective short of this goal to eliminate nuclear weapons is unacceptable. Specifically, our efforts are focused on three interlinked campaigns. First is an educational campaign, including a focus on nuclear famine and aimed at engaging a minimum of 1% of the world's population to oppose the doomsday machine nature of the thermonuclear arsenals. 1%, as Paul made so clear today, Paul Chappelle, has been the tipping point in the populations where we knew from prior social and political movements that change occurs. And that's what we seek to activate, 1% of the population. And with your help, we will get to the 1%. Second, a related coalition building campaign among the top non-governmental organizations to present a single and unified voice to various audiences. And third, and quite specifically, is a legal action campaign to bring targeted pressure against nuclear weapon countries for their failure to work in good faith toward and achieve the abolition of nuclear weapons that, are call, that is called for under existing treaties. With the help of individuals such as those of you here tonight, we will exert the necessary pressure on the United States government to call for an international nuclear weapons convention that will abolish nuclear weapons by the year 2020. It's an exciting time at the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and there are many opportunities and ways for all of us and for you to get involved. And as a result of the Foundation's new strategic plan, those ways are very focused and very targeted. And these opportunities will be coming up right now. So I thank you for being here. This is not the end of the evening. But I thank you for being here tonight. And I hope uh, what is clear to you is that there is a renewed sense of commitment among David as a wonderful leader of our foundation and the board of the foundation to achieve this objective of a nuclear weapons-free world by the year 2020.